There are three ways that public land hunting pressure actually makes buck hunting locations more predictable on public land. And that's what I'm gonna talk about in today's video. I'm gonna go through the ways that I approach scouting a new piece of public land or on those pieces that I'm currently hunting, just taking a step back and reassessing and making sure that I'm putting myself in the best area to connect on a big buck. And you know, hunting pressure is normally construed as a, a negative thing, right? That's how I think of it. But um, with the three uh, ways that I'm gonna talk about in this video, um, we can actually turn that negative um, around and use it to our advantage to make sure that we're in the right spots and starting out in the correct locations when we're hunting heavily pressured public land. So the first way that public hunting land pressure makes buck hunting locations more predictable is it reveals to you those places where you should not be hunting. And public land hunting pressure is actually pretty predictable in and of itself. It's predictable in the sense that uh, most folks are gonna hang stands and hunt close to parking lots, ATV trails, homes, road right of ways, any type of public access points, things like that. Most people aren't gonna go real far from those locations. And so how you're gonna do this and identify these areas where you should not be hunting is just start out with your aerial photo. And I actually do this on my locations or if I'm gonna go scout a new piece of property for the first time, I'll zoom in, use all the aerial photography I can, and I'll find those ATV trails. Um, you know, houses and, and rows and things like that are pretty obvious, but uh, those ATV trails um, in my neck of the woods where I'm at up in north central Minnesota, all of our public land just about is heavily roaded, meaning there's ATV trails all over the place on public land. And for a lot of guys who like to go grouse hunting and things like that, it's great. It, and I understand why we do it. But um, for a bow hunter who's trying to target a mature buck, it does create a lot of headaches in the fall because it not only you have grouse hunters and bird hunters and things like that, but uh, it just provides such easy access to everybody. Seems like everybody's got a four wheeler side by side today it makes it really easy to access the interior of these public land parcels. So what I'll do is I will actually draw in an Adobe or, or a, a, a PDF viewer of some sort, um, trace out all of those ATV trail network. I'll actually set a buffer on each side of it and I'll shade that in and I, I pretty much just rule that area out. I'm not gonna hang a stand near one of these ATV trails just because again, the, the part of the country where I'm at, the amount of hunting pressure we have on public land, it's just not even worth my time to start there. There's too much human activity, there's too much intrusion, and for the age class of bucks at the top of the triangle, the, the top of the age structure, um, in general, they're not bedding near or hanging out close to those ATV trails, and so I'll just rule those out right away. That's the first way that public land hunting pressure actually starts to make things predictable in the sense that uh, you can you can surely bet that the mature bucks aren't going to be along those ATV trails near the parking lots, near homes, public road right of ways, things like that. Okay, so the second way that public land hunting pressure makes big buck locations more predictable is that once you've done step one and identified those areas where you're not gonna hunt, where we've now ruled out, you can take that aerial photo, that PDF that you've worked on, sort of hold it back and, and zoom out and look at the big picture and see where those roaded areas are, where the ATV trails are, trailheads, things like that. And we, we've ruled those areas out. Now you can start to look for those large chunks of land where there is no human activity, where you don't have the intrusion and the commotion, the grouse hunters, the, the ATV joyriders, things like that, and the other bow hunters. Uh, you know, I, I talk in a lot of my other videos about finding some kind of barrier to access. That's such a key thing. If, you, if there's swamps, I, I love lowland and swamp country where we're at, and we have a lot of that up here on public land. Um, most guys, uh, more, more than nine out of 10 guys and gals who are out bow hunting, if you have to put on a pair of hip boots to get across a swamp back to a swamp island or a distant chunk of high ground on public land, more than nine out of 10 hunters won't do that. They won't put on hip boots and go hike across a wet swamp that requires hip boots in order to hunt over there. 
There's other ways to get away from folks and that is just by distance. You know, if you go a half mile or more, you're through, and I'm talking cross country through the woods, not on a four wheeler trail, but if you're going, if you're actually bushwhacking a half a mile on public land into the thick stuff, you're gonna leave just about everybody behind. Not everyone, there's a lot of other wood ticks out there like, like some of us, you guys watching the video and myself. Um, in any one given hunting area, um, there aren't a lot of them, at least where I'm at. If you go more than a half mile, you're getting away from most people. Again, that's bushwhacking, not on a four-wheeler trail. So that's the second way that big buck locations and behavior actually becomes a little bit more predictable is because the first part was we've ruled out those areas. We can predict where those big bucks won't be because of the human intrusion activity, but now we can start to identify and circle on the map where they will be, where those starting points are that we want to start scouting, start hiking, and start looking at, actually put boots on the ground. We want to start in these areas that don't have that human intrusion, and we've ruled out all of these other areas. And for the oldest age class of bucks, that's where they're going to be in the daylight, is in those areas where they've been undisturbed, where they can get away from human activity and intrusion. And this is the part where you need to strap your boots on and start to start to pound the brush and start actually hiking and scouting these areas. Look for other deer stands. Uh, maybe someone is back in there, but maybe someone's not. And this is where we really start to find the starting point for our stand locations. Now, the third way that uh, public land hunting pressure is gonna make your hunting locations more predictable for a big buck is the time of day when you should be hunting these stands. And I'll go over a couple of scenarios here. Let's take that example of a remote swamp funnel. Um, what I mean by this is, is picture two land masses. Um, we've ruled out areas around it where there's ATV trails, homes, roads, things like that. And we have this block of land that's non-roaded, it's hard to get access, it's big, expansive. Let's say there's two land masses, some swamp here and here, and there's an hourglass of land that connects uh, two younger clear cuts, let's say, for example, um, just as a hypothetical. And in that rut funnel, um, you've connected a doe group over here and a doe group over here in these clear cuts. Or maybe there's a distant egg field over here and a distant uh, food plot over here and you find a connecting hourglass of land somewhere way back in a remote swamp funnel type area. No other hunters back there. Um, you would be amazed at the number of daylight bucks that I get on camera in spots like that uh, throughout the rut. And it, it's typically that bell curve, I've done a video on this, on you know that peak activity the last few days of October leading into the first few days in November, of November, really that seeking phase of the rut um, before they get on does and they're spending more time in doe family group areas. But um, that's the kind of location where you could sit all day, that remote swamp funnel that I am describing. Um, all day sit type spot, middle of the day type spot, late morning. Um, really a classic setup there, one that I love, but you got to be really careful with those. If it is a truly remote spot, and I'm talking way back in there, um, those kind of spots can be as much of a mental game as anything. You will get pictures of big daylight bucks going through them during the rut, but you know you could have a handful of days go by without any deer going through there. Um, in the areas where I hunt, uh, low deer densities, big expansive chunks of public land, there aren't a lot of doe family groups in any one given spot unless there's a young clear cut or some food source or reason for them to be there. So in a remote swamp funnel like that, or a remote rut funnel, let's call it, there aren't a lot of does and bucks aren't spending time right there milling around throughout the fall. They're just passing through on that long range trip from this doe family group over here to this one over here. So if you're gonna hunt a spot like that, it can break you mentally if you don't see, if you could do two all day sits in a row and not see a single deer in a spot like that. And you have to be mentally prepared for that. That's something I've struggled with over the years is keeping confidence in those types of spots when you know, you'll know, you sit for two, three days and not see a deer. Um, you really start to question yourself and what you're doing and your buddies are seeing deer on their food plots and get all, got all kinds of stories. You just gotta mentally prepare yourself to hunt a spot like that. 
Um, another example I'll talk about is let's say you find one of those barriers to access. Let's say you find a wet swamp that you need to wear hip boots to cross and there's a, a cool swamp island um, near and then you know on the private there's an egg field let's say. That's the kind of spot you could slip into in the morning on the backside from the public. Try to quietly go through that swamp with hip boots on. Get in there set up in the dark. Great morning bedding area hunting spot. Late morning kind of a late morning rut cruising type spot. Um, really good setup there. So depending on which area um, that you're hunting in and what kind of a setup you find. Maybe it's that remote distant uh, rut funnel where you've gotten away from other hunters. Maybe it's a barrier to access type thing where you're near a, a food concentration, near an egg field or a food plot and then on the public land you, you found a cool swamp island or something by yourself. Um, it's going to drive what time of day is going to be best to hunt these locations depending on the scenario. You know, some of them might be all day sit type spots, middle of the day rut funnels, others might be good early morning spots and, and more morning related. Um, on the flip side, this is kind of the holy grail if you can find one of these would be uh, a place by yourself where you can get away from other hunters intercepting deer in the evening going to a food source. Those are extremely rare on public land and in extremely rare in the sense that usually if it's a spot where you can get catch them on their way to their evening food source, there's gonna be other hunters around if you're on public land. That's what I've found in my area. So if you haven't yet, uh, hit that thumbs up button for me if you enjoyed the video or got any value out of it, that helps out small channels like mine, so I appreciate that. And I hope you guys can use this video. If you guys are going out uh, scouting this spring, um, think about some of these three concepts. Um, let me know down in the comments what you guys think if you use this type of approach when you're scouting public land or if you got any questions anything like that until next time you guys take care